Pixel Sift is proudly supported by Murdoch University School of Arts. Have you ever thought to yourself, I'd really love to learn how to make something creative like a game or YouTube channel or report on the news? Well, you should have a look at what is on offer at Murdoch University. They'll give you the skills to hit the awesome creative goals you're aiming for. Keen to learn more? Have a look at murdoch.edu slash arts to find out what they've got on offer. That's murdoch.edu slash arts, or you can search Murdoch University for more information. Murdoch University School of Arts, proudly supporting Pixel Sift. Pixel Sift. Yes, hello and welcome to Pixel, Pixel Sift, the show dedicated to indie games from around the world and Australia. My name is Scott and joining me tonight is my co-host Daniel. How are we, mate? Fantastic, yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. Uh, our guests tonight are Maze Wallen and Jason Backer. They are from Melbourne's Ghost Pattern, who are making the lovely point-and-click adventure game Wayward Strand, which has just been selected as... Oh, which has just been selected as a winner for PAX Australia Indie Showcase. Uh, hello to you both. Are you okay? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> just right outside. Yeah, beautiful timing. Uh, so again, welcome. Uh, first off, though, Daniel, what else will we be taking a look at? So you might know that Kickstarter is a big part of indie games funding and marketing, but you might not know that the staff at Kickstarter are currently organising to form a union. Uh, well, Kickstarter, the company, has just fired some prominent orga- organisers and a big list of creators who use Kickstarter are now standing with them in solidarity. All right, let's do it. Hey there, if you're enjoying the show and you want to hear more, subscribe to Pixel Sift on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, or listen on pixelsift.com.au. See you there. Kickstarter is a big part of indie games, and it's where a lot of creators get their break and build that community and audience. And the people who work at the company who runs Kickstarter are currently trying to organize to form a union so that they can work together for better conditions. But people have alleged Kickstarter of attempting to break the union efforts after employees and organizers Clarissa Redwine and Taylor Moore were both fired recently. That's prompted a number of high-profile creators who use Kickstarter to, t- to stand in solidarity with them, some of these being Anita Sarkeesian, Jay Tholen, who developed Dropsy and Hyperspace Outlaw, writer Neil Ga- uh, Gaiman, Tanya X. Short, uh, who is the developer of Boyfriend Dungeon. So, Maze and Jason, what is your reaction to this news? I think US labor laws need improving. <laughs> it's a- <laughs> significantly harder to fire people for um, organising here in Australia. Mm. But, yeah, they still find ways to get around it. Yeah, there's a, it seems like in the US there are these, there's this, like, Byzantine process that you need to go through in order to actually protect yourself legally from, um, from, that, from that kind of uh, retribution, which is a real shame. And, yeah, I think we're a lot luckier in Australia from what I know. So, following an article f- from uh, Brian Benchoff, uh, he goes to say that last March, last March, when the tech industry learned uh, employers at Kickstarter were unionising with help from the Office of Professional Employees International Union, Local 153, uh, that it's a remarkable step for the tech company and many, many employers have tried and the video game industry in particular has seen many calls for unionisation um, with not much coming about so far. Uh, unf- unfortunately, the official reason for the union uh, organisers firing is performance-related issues, and um, as you would expect, it's turned into a bit of a they-said-they-said they said deal. Um, however, um, there's been no reports of Kickstarter firing, firing non-union organisers, which is, I don't know. I don't know. It's a bit messy. It seems a little, little bit coincidental so far anyway, because they've been saying that it wasn't because of any union-related activities Um but over on Twitter, uh, Clarissa Redwine was actually saying that she was doing really well as far as performance and excelling. And so it, there's kind of a dichotomy between there. Yeah. Uh, and there's another article on Slate um, where Kickstarter actually responded to some of their charges. And they said uh, they'd like to re- reiterate that the employees were not singled out because of their organizing activities. Um, we've terminated three other people um, since March, um, or given, yeah, we've also given raises to 14 people who were public about their support for the union and promoted three of those people. We can't suspend the routine operations of the company while the staff considers whether a union is right for them. 
And look, that's that's a strong response, but um, I mean, Mays and J- Jason, you are both uh, mm. part of Game Workers Unite. Uh, wh- how, how do you feel about that response from the company? Um, look, like I think it's not up to us to decide who's right, obviously, but mm. going to side with the um, victim in this case, obviously. And, you know, they should take him to court. Kickstarter's got heaps of money, <laughs> you know, you should do all right. Mm. Um, but, yeah, the pair of the last two people who are fired do want their jobs back. Um, and in Australia we can uh, say that we've had an unfair dismissal and we can ask for our jobs back. But it is so often people don't want their jobs back unless it's um, a large amount of people and then we can all get hired back together. Well, that was actually a part of it as well, um, that they were offered um, as part of, well, as part, as a clause of their severance package, they had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which they all said no to, which is, you know, a great thing because mm. it's turned into this story, basically. There was a quote also from Taylor Moore on Twitter. He said, the union busting campaign that Kickstarter management is engaging is illegal and wrong. And he also added that it is an unforgivable abandonment of the values of an organization that I've loved and served with my whole heart. That's also seemed to have resonated with a bunch of other creators and backers. And notably, um, one of the publishers, uh, Evil Hat Productions, for instance, is delaying the launch of its 15th campaign, mainly to see how things sort of shake out as the story unfolds. And there's also a um, letter that was formed on the current affairs, more than 100 other creators have signed it in support for these um, em- employees of Kickstarter that were let go. Mm. Um, Maze and Jason, just wondering, have you guys engaged in crowdfunding before or would you ever put any of your projects uh, crowdfunding as far as the landscape's looking uh, like at the moment? There's definitely a better time to do it than <laughs> now. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, because I think, you know, in video games at the moment, there is kind of like a big push towards uh, like um, unionizing and towards like uh, cooperatives and mm. um, kind of moving away from the traditional like super hierarchical structure. And so mm. as in, uh, in, in the indie video game world, we're kind of moving in that direction. It seems very um, opposite to that to work with a company that is actively working against that um, that general kind of movement. I think when a workforce is in the pro- process of unionising, then you really need to listen to what they want. Um, and this is where unions have gotten, like trade unions have gotten in trouble is sort of jumping what the, uni- what the workers have actually requested. Mm-hmm. So on, on the case of Kickstarter United, they've requested that people don't um, boycott Kickstarter um, because they still believe in that mission and, you know, perhaps the majority of Kickstarter is still good. Um, I think at the same time, like, there are people currently funding their projects on Kickstarter as well and those people we still want to support. Yeah, I wouldn't be boycotting Kickstarter uh, when it's not something that the workers currently want us to be doing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for watching Pixel Sift, your indie game interview podcast live on Twitch. If you've just tuned in, we're talking about Kickstarter and their allegations that they are trying to stop unionization of their workers. A lot of creators are standing in solidarity with them. It's not an easy country to do that action in. <laughs> mm. I, uh, I went to GDC at the start of this year and talking to a lot of people that were working in the industry or had gone into freelance and stuff like that. This is a little bit off topic, but still to do with unionization. And a lot of them that I heard were a lot of horror stories, actually, about examples such as um, people being brought on for a year contract and then that contract running out and getting rehired just so the companies don't have to give them things like healthcare and benefits and stuff like that. So it is definitely needed uh, as far as that's concerned. Yeah, that happens in Australia as well. And, you know, is what we call sham contracting Mm. where you're um, treated as an employee but not given any of the benefits like superannuation or annual Mm. leave um, 
or any contractual rights. Yeah. Um, with Kickstarter being such a big um, tech company in the world, do you think the outcome of this will affect how things go forward, not only in America, of course, but for us here in Australia as well? I think it would be great for it to be an industry standard and possible, you know, should be thinking about themselves at the moment as an Australian version of Kickstarter. Um, yeah. What is, what is the state of uh, their unionisation going forward? Is there anything uh, in, in opposable waters? I'm not sure. I don't work for them. Yeah. <laughs> We're obviously going to follow this one going forward. Uh, it's going to be evolving and emerging. We might just leave that one there and jump into the next topic, hey? All right. You're listening to Pixel Sift. Or you might be watching Pixel Sift on Twitch. Pixel Sift. Tonight we're talking to Maze Wallen and Jason Backer about their latest game, Wayward Strand. It's a story of a teenage girl exploring an urban airborne hospital. Uh, so Maze and Jason, uh, in your own words, can you give us a summary of what Wayward Strand is all about? Yeah, sure. Um, so Wayward Strand, yeah, as you were saying, it's a story of a teenage girl who uh, explores an airborne hospital and um, uh, meets and gets to know the uh, the residents, uh, the patients and the staff inside. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's uh, quite like a touching and uh, empathetic narrative um, that's kind of structured in a way where uh, all of the stories aboard the ship, all, all of the characters aboard the ship, their lives kind of play out simultaneously. So Casey, the player as Casey kind of wanders around and can, as well as having her own conversations with characters, she can overhear um, characters as they talk to each other or like follow a character to see what they are doing at this particular time of the day. Um, and because of that structure, you're, as the player, you're kind of seeing, you've got like a specific window into all of the various things that are happening on the ship. Um, and, you know, then you can play it again and you get to see, uh, get more context on, on, on what goes on. Uh, one of the more unique as aspects of the game is its setting. Uh, we don't see a huge amount of games that are set in Australia. Uh, plenty are made here, but as a location, it's not that common. Uh, why did you choose to set the story here? To clarify, it's off the coast of Victoria in 1978. Yeah. So it's very specific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 27 to 29? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, in terms of like why we wanted to set it here, I mean, I think we were all excited about telling um, a story set in a set in Australia and set in places that we have like a connection to. Um, for me personally, a lot of it came from um, like I'm really into uh, short fiction, and a lot of short fiction is set in places where um, that the author does have a personal connection to, and that comes out in the story and um, it just felt like that was a natural kind of um, approach for us. Um, it, initially it could have kind of been set anywhere but by setting it in a specific place that we we each connect to in a different way um, I think that's really enriched the um, like the stories and the characters and um, that's been we've been drawing so much of that uh, real history of of, the, of places like that at the time uh, into the story. Yeah, it definitely couldn't be set anywhere anymore. Yeah, totally. Um, and even like we've been working with the Bunurong Land Council, um, who are the Indigenous nation of that land, uh, which for us is like around near Interlock, mm. um, for anyone who's local to Victoria. <laughs> and yeah, really learning a true sort of representation of the history back then. Um, yeah. It seems like there's a lot of um, your you in this, uh, in this game, uh, as well as an interest of, you know, like you said, the natural uh, Indigenous of the land. Um, what do you hope this game will mean for players? Um, like, I think um, 
like a story of, you know, people connect to stories in different ways. And I think some like players that have a similar connection to um to to the to the place or to the time uh will feel something that what we've put in uh, in a similar way to we do uh, to how we do but i think also it's very interesting to set something in a very specific place and time for people that have no real connection to that um just because that kind of allows them to find out about like um kind of our representation of how things could have been in this in this place that uh, where we're drawing from real history and um, uh, experiences and uh, interviews. And that kind of thing. Mm. I think even through the development of making this and we've been working together for three years, yeah. even making more. Yeah. Um, uh, coming into it, there's a lot of me, especially being in indie games, is like get me out of Australia and being in <laughs> fine arts as well, as, which is where I was then and less solidified in games. Um, there's just a lot of sort of anti-Australian that I'd grown up with. Um, mm. And, yeah, being able to connect in this way um, and through this game and then through the extra learning as I've grown up, you know, uh, so consciously has really helped with that. And I think part of it is that, yeah, games take up a whole lot of the media that I consume mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. meaning that I don't consume a lot of Australian media. All yeah. I see is how awful our country is on the news, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is, you know, not debating that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I get the chance to embrace some of our humour. Yes, yeah. there's, there's more than just uh, how terrible we are. Yeah. And Maze, earlier you mentioned the studio. I actually just wanted to ask, um, you've actually organized your studio structure in an interesting way. And as a co-op, can you tell us what that is and why you chose it to do it this way? Well, we're, we're, we're in transition to becoming a co-op. We're not quite there yet. A little bit of paperwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. um, but, uh, like, it's just something that um, I think makes sense to a lot of us, like, um, we, as we came together to create Wayward Strand, um, we didn't really, like, things didn't really fall out in, like, a kind of hierarchical way. Like, it feels very much like each person is bringing their own kind of knowledge and their own experience and their own, um, uh, yeah, excitement to creating the game and, um, I think we're just kind of excited about um, setting up the structure of the company to reflect that um, lack of hierarchy. Um, yeah. yeah. With a heavy dose of anti capitalist values. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We definitely believe that people should get. Uh, back what they put in and um, often the company structure uh, the standard company structure anyway doesn't actually allow for that it's more about getting as much as you can out of an employee yeah mm-hmm. yeah like initially we was um, we did we did initially create a company like a more traditional company structure and that's what we're transitioning away from mm-hmm. uh, but yeah as with as we were moving forward, we just realized how, um, yeah, how intensely hierarchical that is and how undemocratic that is. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think democracy, especially small scale democracy is pretty cool. And I think that, mm. uh, people like kind of sharing power around a group of people is good. And so, um, co-ops are really, really all defined around that. Mm. Uh, we have a question from Twitch. Uh, Yellow Materia asks, do you reckon people who aren't good at games could play this? Yes. Definitely. <laughs> it's for people who aren't good at games. I'm not good at games. <laughs> I'm awful at games. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely really are excited about getting people playing this that don't, like, play all that many games or don't, um, yeah, they might be, you know, generally 
somebody who like reads a lot of books or watches TV shows or something. But I think the way with Strand, with the way that it's structured and um, the the input method for Wayward Strand is just we're basically trying to keep it the same as a website. You're just moving a mouse around and clicking on options. Uh, but the actual um, experience itself is at the same time very deep in that you can explore all of these different paths and uh, this kind of complex interwoven narrative. Um, but you don't have to know anything about games to be to to play away with Strand and to enjoy it. Thanks for watching Pixel Sift. If you're just joining us on one of our live platforms, we're talking to Maze Wallen and Jason Backer about their game Wayward Strand. Um, something that is really obvious as soon as you look at the game is that it's pretty gorgeous. And I'm really curious myself, what inspired sort of the art style and art direction of the game? It kind of has this Wes Anderson sort of feel. I'm not really sure how to describe it, but it's very endearing. Yeah, there's... um. Like there's a ton of inspirations that have, uh, <laughs> have gone and that, and um, the uh, we've got a pretty awesome team of artists that and neither one of us uh, is neither of us are on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like yeah, yeah, we get input and yeah, like that obviously. But yeah. yeah, Goldie Bartlett has been working on nailing that art style for a really long time, yeah. um, uh, with the help from everyone else, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely uh Wes Anderson films like The Lamp Aquatic is something that we actually watched as a team uh yeah. a couple of years back, which was like a really nice um mm. time to spend. That was um, also to when so originally the game was not on this sort of side on yeah, yeah, Um it was more cinematic and Jason and Russ, the other main programmer, um, were really into it being very cinematic yeah. um, and that's real hard to do but and but then also for a variety of reasons like being able to um, realize the rest of the ship and what was happening on the ship yeah. um, it swapped to side on and I think that changed things a lot and helped us to find the art style I think yeah, yeah. totally yeah, yeah kind of the getting into the current mix that we have of like a little bit theatrical, but still feeling like a, a space for people. Um, yeah. A little bit dollhouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. A so lot of Art Deco and like 70s Australian. I remember Goldie looking up a lot of 70s fashion. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Esther's jumper is a really good example of that. A mm. cockatoo knitted jumper. It's mm, yes. <laughs> <just> awesome. <laughs> Um, I'm interested to know what it was like designing the sound for the game, and did ha having things, ha having the game be somewhat linear while also sti still being quite dynamic, create any challenges at all? Yes, <laughs> I mean it's something that I've always this sort of heavily system run sound. Um, some of the simpler things, like yeah, there's soundtracks and room and stuff, um, is harder to actually implement, you know, um, uh, but easy to think about design ways wise. One of the harder things to think about was when the camera zooms in and out. So when you're really close to a room and when you're further away, how much of other people's voices should the player be able to hear? Yeah. Um, how understandable should people be? You know, how much of outside the ship should people be able to hear? And those are really design decisions that we didn't anticipate at the start. Um, we've had a lot of different variations of, yeah. But also the soundtrack, yeah. Um, <laughs> on the music side, uh, we've played a lot with how prescriptive of emotion we should be because on the one hand, you know, Casey is new to this and she's not aware of what's going on all around the hospital. Um, and whose emotions should we be trying to portray? Is it Casey or is it each individual character that she's talking to or is it more about, like, the player attitude? There's just a lot of storylines yeah. <laughs> to think about um, who you want to, yeah, portray. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky because you can kind of be in one room and be, like, emotional scene happening 
uh, that you can, like, because of the nature of the game, you can kind of leave time and go different as, like, a something comedic happening in that some totally other thing. And so I think that's something as well where, like, we have to be careful tonally what we're, what we're trying to do and, yeah, not be very kind of con- uh, overly controlling or manipulative of the player's emotions through through music. Yeah, but also on the narrative side, like, do we want that? Yeah. What's a crying room to a laughing room? Yeah. Like, yeah, maybe we do. What do you think? Should we have that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I think I wanted to play the game in its current state before I, I start <laughs> giving suggestions. <laughs> we were lucky enough to actually have. A, <laughs> we, were ha- we were lucky enough to actually have a bit of a play uh, last year when we were over for PAX as well. So it's really nice to see it kind of coming f- the full circle. Yeah. yeah, it's huge. The differences. I wanted to yeah. ask you. Oh, sorry, um, I wanted to ask you both. What What's your favorite aspect of the game, and what do you sort of enjoy the most? as you play, and does that change as development goes on? Like, the development at the moment is has been my favourite aspect of the game. It's just actually working on it because, you know, learning about um, becoming a co-op. This is also, I was joking with um, the team a few weeks ago that this is the longest thing I have ever done. <laughs> like, this is longer than my degree. So <laughs> it's a bit wow. like... Um, but yeah and learning about Australia and where I'm actually from has been pretty awesome yeah. uh, Yellow Materia on Twitch has come in again with another question Is do you write the game with an idea that young kids can sometimes miss emotional uh, subtleties yeah definitely um, and that's uh, there are certain storylines uh, within the game that are kind of built around um Casey potentially not understanding what is going on in a particular character's life straight away, or um, potentially even Casey missing the social cues that an adult would pick up on. Um, but then there's, there's an interesting element to that as well, that there is some player choice in that, that a player, um, you know, a player might pick up on some of that subtlety and then not ask that question that Casey could ask if she was uh, being a little bit like unaware of, uh, of what's going on. Yeah, it gets pretty intense with the old on the ship um, yeah. and the medical staff as well. And it can be, yeah, those quite deep sort of feelings or it can be really surface level. Like I see ask someone what, some words mean that she doesn't understand. You know, yeah. They're sort of medically type words. I, yeah. uh, I noticed on the blog um, that there was a couple of extra Wayward Strand related jam games. Could you tell us about those? Oh, yeah. Um, so there's, uh, we're, we've done two jams together so far, and um, each one has been kind of like a way to explore. Um, explore the story a bit more or explore our uh, characters' stories a bit more. Uh, the first one was called uh, Wayward Hand. Uh, so not Wayward Strand, but Wayward Hand. And it's this <laughs> game, right? Um, you have this, like, uh, a hand of one of... Uh, there are three in each scene. It's one of our characters, and you have their hand, and you're in... Uh, you're controlling their hand, and you um, an environment kind of like uh, one of you know one of their environments and looking around and picking up different objects and hearing that character talk about that object or hearing hearing something that relates to that object from that character's memory. Um, and then the second one is called uh, Sabotage in Stormy Skies, and we made that to explore a history which turned out to be a bit of like a um, you know, a potential history of the ship itself. And in that, um, one of our characters tells another the story of how the ship was originally lost at sea um, before washing up on the shores of uh, of rural Australia. (laughs) Sounds like a really organic sort of process. And I'm curious myself, does the game jam sort of inform decisions and stuff or... 
like you said, backstories about certain characters, or is it the other way around? Sort of both. Like with yeah. Wayward Hand, it was really us taking the weekend to fill out these characters that we hadn't finished writing yet. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and explore them and even come up with like, ah, oh, this person's bedroom would look like this because we hadn't modelled it yet, you mm. know, we had not figured out all of the constraints yet. Um, and, you know, from an audio perspective, even that, even the soundtrack was very different. So the music has gone through probably four sort of main different soundtracks before it settled on this quite acoustic guitar-based soundtrack. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so it's been really, yeah, I think we definitely use it to improve. Yeah, totally. Yeah, like I don't think to me be nearly as into gardening as we would have been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, yeah. that is all the time we have for today. Um, one more chat, for, uh, one more comment from Twitch uh, from Gems Tones says, "Yay, co-ops!" Uh, <laughs> thanks, Sam. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Maze and Jason, again for joining us. Uh, if you are listening or watching at home, you can find Wayward Strand at PAX Australia as part of the Indie Showcase. Uh, find it on yeah. Twitter and Facebook at Wayward Strand, or head to waywardstrand.com. Thanks heaps for having us, and yeah, come see us at PAX. Yeah, wish list us. You on Steam soon. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> on Monday. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening to, to episode 131 of Pixel Sift. This episode has been hosted by myself and Daniel. Thank you for joining me tonight, Daniel. Thank you. Pixel Sift is produced by Scott Quigg, Sarah Island, Fiona Bartholomeos, Mitch Lowe and Gianni DiGiovanni is our executive producer. We wouldn't have been able to make 131 episodes of Pixel Sift if we didn't have the support of Murdoch University. Go and check them out and tell them we sent you. If you're keen to learn more about a great creative degree, head to murdoch.edu slash arts. As always, I'll be sticking links to topics we talked about in the show notes on our website, www.pixelsift.com.au. And come join us on our Discord. We'd love to have you there. That's pixelsurfer.com.au slash Discord, where you can share your creative work, talk about topics and games and anything else. pixelsurfer.com.au slash Discord. Yep, uh, we'll be mixing it up next week. Instead of the usual Pixel Sift plays, we'll have another interview. So tune in this time next week for another episode of Pixel Sift. Uh, That's all for this week. Thank you for joining us, and we'll catch you next time. 